Good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce you to this uh, session on public dialogues. And we will discuss together if these are valuable tools actually for public engagement in a higher ed education institution. Just briefly, my name is Michela Bertero. I am responsible international and scientific affairs at the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona, and I'm also coordinating the Orion projects, which also provides the framework for these uh, for these uh, sessions. So let me first introduce you briefly on the Orion Open Science project. It's a, a little bit longer than four year project funded under Horizon 2020 in the Science with and for Society program. And we have an ambitious goal to, to embed uh, responsible research innovation and open science uh, principle in research organization and funders in the domain of life sciences. And we want to do this through what we call co-creation experiments, no? including public dialogue. And the project received the funding of approximately 3 million euros and includes the nine partners that you see represented here in the European map, four research institutes, two funding organizations, a group on social sciences, which is fundamental also for all the evaluation activities um, of the experiments that we are carrying out and the two civil society organizations. Before we enter into the, the sessions, so just some housekeeping messages for Zoom. I know you're all experts by now, but just a few reminders. So when the panelists will be speaking, if you can please switch off your, your microphone and also do your, your video if you want. Uh, the green arrow in the slide leads you if you want to include your, your name, so we can also see the different people participating. And the purple circle uh, illustrates the icon for the chat, so when there will be time for questions, you can include your question in the chat or you can also raise your hands and we will uh, do our best to moderate all the questions. The session is going to be recorded, but we will make openly available only the sessions with the panelists, so not the sessions where you ask a question and we'll debate all together. So this is the, the agenda for this hour ahead of us. So first, a very brief introduction on what a public dialogue is and why they're useful. Uh, then we will go into the public dialogues that we organize within the Orion project. We decided to focus on a specific disruptive technology relevant in life sciences research in medicine, which was also awarded a Nobel Prize this year. And then I think uh, uh, we will, and will, an interesting part would also be uh, the um, opinions from the different uh, uh, organizer participants of the dialogues and in different institutions. And another important session will be to brainstorm together, no, to discuss with you about uh, this uh, uh, approach. And finally, some concluding remarks. Before actually uh, discussing what the public dialogue is, maybe we would like also to know a little bit the audience. So we would like to ask you to go to menti.com and use the code here in these slides. You can, we will also share it in the, in the chat. And you can uh, let us know if you already have participated or organized a public dialogue uh, yourself. So I'll stop briefly sharing. I will let my colleague uh, Michael, who is running the Menti, and we will see your, your answer and your experience. Okay, it seems that several of the participants actually have no experience on, on public dialogues before. And some actually as organizers, so I, I'm sure there will be an interesting exchange of, uh, of ideas. I hope it's not only Orion public dialogue organizers. <laughs> and also one as a member of the public, so it would be good to and you're also four in a different roles. So we will have more or less all the different roles represented. I don't know if everybody has, has answered already, Mike. I... I, I guess we can go on. Okay, so more or less the, the trend. So 
Well, I'll, I'll share it again, my... Yes, Emma? Yes. Okay. Okay, what a public dialogue is, very, very briefly. So it's a, it's a process, I would say an open process also, during which member of the public citizens interact more or less on the same ground also with scientists, stakeholders and policy makers to discuss and deliberate on issues of science and technology relevant for future uh, decisions. And uh, here we highlight the science-wise guiding principles to run a public dialogue, which is probably like a more common practice in, in the UK, but you know, in Orion, different partners are represented and for, for us was definitely a, a new approach. And why public dialogues are important? Well, they to inform the government, public organizations, also uh, research organization, no? To, to think, to deliberate about specific uh, science and technology issues. So to, they, are, I, they are important, they, they are novel tools and also to facilitate better discussion. And it's also a way of opening up research and policy making. So it's also part of the open science of open research uh, movement. And now we will dive into the very briefly on the Orion Open, Dialog open Public Dialogues. And I would like to introduce my colleague, Emma Martinez, She's public engagement officer at the Bebron Institute, and she has been coordinating the public dialogues in the Orion project. Thank you very much, Michaela. So within the Orion Open Science Project, we run a public dialogue to explore the public attitudes regarding uh, the partner's research using genome editing. So this has been a project that has uh, spanned over two years from 2018 to the end of this year. And the budget has been 120,000 uh, pounds, exclusive VAT. And the approach and methodology of the public dialogue itself has been one and a half days reconvene event with 30 citizens. And it has taken place in four um, countries in Europe where the Orion partaking organizations are located. Three of these uh, organizations are fundamental life sciences research organizations. So one is the uh, CETEC, the Central European Institute for Technology in Berna, Czech Republic. The other one is the Max the, Brook Cent Max, the Brook Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin, Germany. And then us, the Babraham Institute in Cambridge. And finally, we have an organization in Stockholm, Sweden, which is uh, public and science. And this is a not-for-profit organization that seeks to uh, to um, build dialogue and openness between researchers and the public. Um, Michele, if you can please click in the presentation. The workflow of the dialogue is what is shown now here in the presentation. So we, the Orion Coalition, designed the project specification. So the document outlining the objectives, the goals, the desired outcomes and outputs of the dialogue. This went through uh, several rounds of review. So first by the one international advisory group, which provide oversight and guidance. Um, and then after this round of feedback, it went into four review groups. So one in each country. And this was for adapting the general methodology to the national and institutional context of all those partaking organizations. And then uh, this, all the materials and feedback went to the commission organization uh, assigned to conduct and uh, facilitate the public dialogues, which was Ipsos Mori. And they took into consideration all the feedback and they prepared materials for engaging the stakeholders. So we also wanted to um, know what the, the stakeholders from different perspectives in the genome editing uh, sphere were thinking that we need to communicate with the public. And that was the role of the stakeholder workshops, which also happened in all four countries. And once uh, with the stakeholders uh, feedback, uh, Ipsos Mori produced the research materials to be used in the events with the public. Uh, so all these uh, documents were passed again through the feedback loop before uh, we went on to discuss with the public in those one and a half days reconvened event. Uh, Michele, if you can please click again. So here I highlighted some of the findings of the public, not Michele. Can you see the yeah. findings? Because I see yes. 
Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, those are some of the findings that uh, we that I wanted to highlight today with you. Uh, so basically, there was a limited awareness of genome editing, and this is a recurrent finding that we also found in a public attitude survey that the Orion Consortia conducted in 2018 on life sciences research and public involvement and genome editing. So we need to do a little bit better to increase awareness about genome editing. The other important finding of this dialogue has been the support for basic research. So um, there was limited knowledge about fundamental research among participants. However, once it was explained what is the exploratory role of fundamental research and their, their role within the whole scientific process, uh, the participants were very positive about um, the importance of this uh, to bring developments for society. And finally, another highlight of the public dialogue has been that there, was a, there is a need for a two-way engagement for such a kind of uh, processes such as this public dialogue. So participants in our dialogue, they, they favor, let's say, um, communication uh, approaches that have wider reach, such as TV and online. However, they really praise and value the interaction with the scientists in this face-to-face -face petite small events. So it inspired us to keep on providing these two ways interactive uh, opportunities. If you want to hear more about the results of the public dialogue itself, I invite you to join the launch of the findings, which will take place on the 21st of January next year. If you want to do so, get in contact with me or with anybody in Orion. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. So you have now a, a brief overview of the four dialogues. And now we'll hear also about representative from the different institutes that participated in the dialogue. So let me first introduce the panelists and then I'll, um, I'll give them the, the word. So the first will be Maria Haggard. She's International Relation and Communication Manager at VA Public and Science in Stockholm, in Sweden. Then we will have Zoe Ingram. She's a researcher actually in education. Uh, in the communication department at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin, in Germany. We will also have Esther Jarur. She is a public relation and communication manager at the Central European Institute of Technology uh, in Broad, Central Republic. We will also have uh, Peter Raggan. is a PI group leader, expert on epigenetics at the Babermann Institute, and he was one of the experts at the events with the public. And then we will have the view of the independent evaluators of the dialogues, specifically in the UK. Unfortunately, Richard Watermeyer is, is not feeling well, so Jean Rowe will uh, present his, uh, his views. So now I'll stop uh, sharing and I'll give you the word first to, to Maria. Thank you, Michaela. So as uh, Emma also mentioned, we are an NGO uh, and the National Node for Science Communication and Public Engagement sits in science in Sweden. So our main motivation for running the public dialogues were to try out new ways of engaging citizens with science and collecting their views on disruptive technologies, but also to engage the members of the public in research who might, may not usually get their voice heard. But we also wanted to test this methodology that would allow us to draw conclusions that could also be compared with the other countries that participated. However, um, it is very time consuming and uh, a personnel resource consuming to arrange and run a public dialogue uh, as we also did the organization and the moderation ourselves. And it's, it's a bit costly to recruit and organize large meetings, uh, which is something to consider uh, really the impact it might give you. But um, you also have to take into the account, and which we, we did also, is the, the culture factor. Uh, as Emma explained, we did four dialogues in four different countries in four languages. So a lot of emphasis has to be put on planning, timing, finding suitable venues, and translation is very important because the, the message has to come through in the right language in the right way. Although all these challenges, uh, we definitely saw the, a great value of doing this by and also bringing the genome editing researchers and members of the general public together. 
and the attitude shift it brought both within the experts and the participants. And we also saw that the information asymmetry that existed at the beginning of the dialogues made it difficult to find common ground for discussions. But once we had addressed this through the presentations and exercises, the discussions became much easier and we could see the benefits on both sides. Thanks a lot, Maria. We will move now to Zoe. Hi, I'm Zoe Ingram from the Max Delbrick Center for Molecular Medicine. I was involved in the organization and coordination of the stakeholder workshop and also both of the public dialogues that were taking place. And before the public dialogue started, we were really interested to understand what the public um, or what the citizens think about uh, disruptive technologies in general and what they think about our research that we're doing and what their attitude and feeling towards it is. So if they have more distrust or trust or concerns and what are they and how they weigh the costs and the benefits. Um, we had overall a very good experience. This was the first time that we were using, uh, we had an audience that we didn't recruit ourselves, So um, they didn't have the intrinsic motivation uh, per se or interest in science that we usually have. And we think that the event went really, really well. Um, the participants were very engaged. It was a very small format that was intimate. We had, uh, as Emma said before, around 30 participants and there was an, on each table 10 and there was always an, a scientist that was, so to say, a joker. And um, this joker was often there, just was more kind of for people if there was a question that they should be asked. But once the scientists were brought in, uh, the people continued to ask questions. And it was really hard for the facilitators to reel them back in and get them back on topic because they had so many questions for the scientists. So that was something that we saw as a, as in our approach anyway, our public engagement approach that we try to facilitate that people have this kind of one-on-one -on -one or intimate kind of um, interaction with each other. And this was again, seen as very valuable. Um, also for our scientists, it was a very nice experience, especially the young scientists that have not taken part in any public engagement kind of events. They were very interested um, or very excited about the enthusiasm that the public brought with them. So yeah, we're gonna continue on with that. Thanks a lot, Zoe. So now we have Esther from SciTech. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Esther Jarour, and I represent the Central European Institute of Technology based in Brno, also known as SATEC. So our primary motivation to join this public dialogue was to learn something about our target audience, in this case, general public. We wanted to understand their attitudes or their potential fears about the genome editing technology and about science. As we believe that this knowledge could help us to improve our communication efforts. Secondly, as we have never done public dialogue before, we saw this as a great chance for us to learn from more experienced partners on the Orion project. What was the most challenging thing? As I said, since it was the first time we did a public dialogue, it was initially a little bit difficult to convince scientists that science communication is a duty of a modern scientist and they should invest their valuable time into, into a public dialogue and into participating into it, especially given the duration and the location of the event. But after all, I would dare to say that this pu that public dialogue was able to drive a very positive change at our institute. It allowed us to connect with um, important stakeholders. In this case, during the stakeholder workshop, we made an important connection with local science popularization superstar, Daniel Stach, who is running a show on the national television every Saturday night at 8 p.m. and is very famous. And he interviewed more than 20 Nobel, Nobel Prize winners and, uh, and many important scientists. And uh, we, may, we managed to convince him to participate on our upcoming research group leaders retreat, where he inspired our scientists and gave them many useful tips. Why is it important to communicate science? And this really drove a huge change. The public dialogue took place one year ago, and we since then tripled our appearance in the, in the Czech media. And our scientists are actively participating and uh, many scientists who were not even from our institute appeared after all in the med media and tried to educate public about the genome editing technology. The main learning of this public dialogue was a very surprising finding 
we we knew or we expected that the atheist Czech society will embrace science and genome editing technology, but we didn't expect that uh, all the 32 participants were not aware about the new genome editing technologies uh, before this workshop. So after receiving some basic information, they embraced it, and we realized that it is extremely important to educate the audience and to communicate science if we want that uh, the people will believe in science and support new and emerging technologies. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Esther. And now we move to, to Peter, uh, the Abraham. Thank you very much, uh, hello everyone. Um, yeah, as Michaela uh, introduced, I was one of the scientists involved in the dialogue events here in Cambridge. Um, and so when thinking about the main motivation for participating in this dialogue, well, um, I had lots of reasons why I wanted to be in involved. Um, firstly, for many years, I've been interested in the intersection of research and society. Um, and in this case, by focusing on the topic of gene editing, I think this really allowed us to explore this intersection in, in depth. Um, and I think this is an important discussion to have because we need to consider as a society how we would like to balance opportunities and the potential risks of gene editing applications. And of course, this needs to be part of an informed discussion. And, and this is where I thought I could contribute to this. Uh, and secondly, these events were an opportunity to understand and to practice how to better communicate about potentially controversial or diverse scientific topics to an audience from different backgrounds, um, especially sort of different backgrounds that we would normally meet in a science festival, for instance. Uh, and so to me, that presented a, an exciting uh, and also challenging opportunity. Um, and so the main challenges while participating, well, um, uh, I was asked some really uh, uh, good questions. That's always an interesting challenge. Uh, quite often, uh, I had to say I, I didn't know, uh, you know, and that's okay. Um, and one of the other main challenges really was to find a way to have a conversation about very complicated scientific topics in a way that's useful and accurate and, and, and meaningful. Um, and, and as you all know, it, you know, it's hard, it's difficult to get this right, but it's, it's very rewarding when you feel as though you've got it right. Um, but I should, I should also add that the events were organized and run extremely well. Um, and this was much appreciated by all of the researchers taking part. And so, um, uh, you know, thinking about what evidence the dialogue gave that supports the work that we do. Well, um, I think for me, this is quite a simple one. I found it really great to hear um, uh, that there was strong support for the research that we do from the public and that in particular fundamental research, the sort that many of us work on was very much valued by the public even without an immediate application of that research. And this was a really sort of spontaneous um, uh, message that came from the public. Um, and that was a really important message that I, I took from these dialogue events and perhaps one that we should, we should recognize uh, a bit more. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So you have heard about the challenges and lessons learned from the four sites where the dialogues were organized. Now, Jean will give us another perspective, not the perspective of the, the perspective of the evaluator. Oh, yes. Hello. Um, now, within this project, Richard and I were engaged to provide an external evaluation of this dialogue and the activities around it in order to help the Babraham Institute in particular learn about the process or learn from the process. Our evaluation has sought to assess the development, implementation and impact of the dialogues. And we've used a variety of methods, including documentary analysis, observation of the dialogues, participant questionnaires and interviews with key stakeholders. Now our particular evaluation is focused on six criteria. That is project management and governance, management and organization of the dialogues, dialogue development, dialogue implementation, dialogue reporting, and impact and uptake. Now, as of this point in time, we have submitted the first two of three reports, which have looked at the initial project development and expectations and the implementation of the dialogues themselves. Now, the evaluation of impact is, of course, to follow. Uh, given the time limits, I'd just like to give you three initial thoughts that Richard and I have that have emerged from this evaluation, but also, I guess, from our 
experience of doing, of evaluating many other events just like this. The first point I'd like to make is one about purpose. Now, one thing that Richard and I have found in conducting evaluations over many years is that often there can be an initial lack of clarity of purpose for events like this. So engagement is often seen as something that is good in and of itself, but often for rather nebulous and ill-defined reasons. Being clear why one is engaging, what one specifically hopes to achieve, is critical in directing both the choice of engagement method and the choice of target population. Now, what we rarely see is any detailed consideration of what will be done with the outputs from engagement, and indeed what could be done in response to different outputs. That is, what will we actually do if the public think X, and what will we do if they think Y instead? Now, we believe such forward thinking will not only ensure better engagement as a process, but greater chances that engagement will have impact. Secondly, I think in terms of implementation, what we have found is that the dialogue, this dialogue, like others we have evaluated, was technically well achieved. I mean, Peter talked about how, how well done it was, and we agree completely. There seems to be significant confidence now, I think, in the community in terms of how to develop and run processes like this, especially such reconvened processes. Thus, we had advisory groups providing input and feedback on the content and form of materials to present to the public participants and significant organizational knowledge for how to compose the dialogue and how to present and collect information and to facilitate the process. Now, as with other events, we have seen the carefully selected participants, selected to be in a sense indicative of the population, were fully engaged in the process and they clearly enjoyed it. Now, establishing what they actually learned from the process, I think is a bit more difficult to tell and we can perhaps discuss this matter later if we have time. Now, my third and final point concerns an issue that has arisen with every project in which Richard and I have been involved. And this concerns the nature, breadth and depth of impact that will or is likely to emerge from this engagement. It's an unfortunate fact of life that projects like this are of finite turn and both the engagement stage and also the evaluation stage have an end date that is abrupt and provides little time to allow for tangible actions and outcomes uh, to emerge. In short, tangible actions such as the development of new policy in engagement with the public or changing organizational direction take time and they're very difficult to confirm. Furthermore, impact may not always be obvious and readily observable and measurable. For example, how does one quantify a change in staff enthusiasm or morale or changes in institutional cultural priorities, very difficult. This speaks to a need, I think, to revisit organizations that have conducted engagement at some period well beyond the end of a project such as this, whether that's six months, a year or two years or however long. But how might this be arranged given conventional project funding um, processes and priorities? And who might fund this? So there are very many practical problems in doing this. And yet if we wish to truly establish uh, the impacts of engagement, this is something that we need to consider more carefully. And that's it, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jean, for your critical uh, view and also highlighting the many challenges that we have been facing with these dialogues. So now it's it's really time for questions. I see there are already some in the in the chat, but as I just remind you, you can also raise your hands and I will give you the, the word. And we we will uh, try to keep up with the with the with the question in the in the chat. So let me start maybe to uh, two questions about the the methodology. Uh, so Steph is asking, how were the participants uh, selected? And uh, related to this, how many countries did the, did the participant come from? So I don't know if maybe Emma, you as, as coordinator of the dialogues, you, you want to answer these first questions? Yeah, thank you, Steph, for your question. So the participants were recruited through a recruiting agency that was subcontracted by Ipsos and they were recruited through specific quotas to represent uh, the national, a national sample. 
So they, in the case of Cambridge, for example, they try to not be representative of Cambridge because we all know it's a, it's a, it's a knowledge bubble. So they went and had several quotas on ethnicity, gender, age, education level, ethnicity, and so on in order to represent the whole population of the UK, for example. But it was done as the same way in the other countries I know. And regarding where the participants came from, so uh, I don't know whether I understand the question correctly, but um, so the, that, the dialogue took place in four different countries. So there was the overarching question. So how do the public, uh, um, the, what are the public attitudes in those four countries regarding the, the Orion partaking organization research that deals with genome editing? So I guess the participants of the public dialogue, the events with the public, were people who were living in those four countries. So uh, in, uh, as I said, representative samples of those countries because there were 30 citizens in each country uh, and they came back for the second event as well. So uh, people from Berno, people, people from the Czech Republic, people from Sweden, people from the UK and people from Germany. Okay. Michaela, there was an important question about uh, if this yes, could I'm be done online. Yes, I'm going to, and uh, my answer to that one directly, actually. So Claudia Fracciola, which probably is coming from the same country where I'm coming from, asked, could this be done on a virtual environment to reduce costs, and especially now that most of us are confined to re regional restrictions? I can, as I said, I, I, I can answer and then uh, our panelists can also add if they have experience. So within Orion, we did another public dialogue, which was in, in this case was not focused on a specific technology, but was focused on the research strategy of an institute, which is the institute where I work. And because of the pandemic, we could not do the dialogue uh, with face-to-face -face meeting as we initially planned following a similar methodology as the public dialogue you heard about before. And so we did it online. Uh, we were scared because it was the, the well we never did the public dialogue and on top of this we had to do it uh, online but it it worked it, it worked very well uh the the dynamic was a little bit different so we didn't have the long meetings we had the short meetings spread through uh, almost two weeks so that's uh, because we know that we are we all get very tired uh online with uh, with zoom but the, the, the public was divided in smaller groups. We are four or five citizens with one scientist. And we, we had very nice and, and rich uh, interaction. So this is the one, just my only limited experience. Uh, but uh, in our case, actually, it, it worked quite well. And I don't know if some of the panelists have experience or, or Jean, you have evaluated our public dialogues online and you can share with, uh, with Claudia. So I also have experience with online public dialogues, Claudia. Um, I participated as an expert on genome editing in uh, food supply in the UK, organized by the base department. So that took place online over the span of a week. And the experts were there available for the public participants to ask us questions. And there was a facilitation company who prepared the materials and they consulted with us whether they were uh, accurate and so on. Um, and the feedback from the audience was quite positive. So we were we were briefed after the public dialogue. Uh, and, and it seems that it was quite valuable for the participants themselves. It, it is very different format to this public dialogue. Thank you. So now we have a question from Amy Cameron at the beginning, which is also quite interesting. Where there are differences between researchers in the different countries to their willingness to, part, to take part in the dialogue? And also where there are differences in findings across the different countries? I don't know who wants to, to answer to this. Probably Emma and then maybe the the Zoe, Peter, and, and Maria Ness, you, you can also add on. Esther raised her hand, so if you want yeah, to go first, I, Esther. I would say for us, it was difficult only initially because uh, we really had never experienced with public dialogue. And in general, science communication is not something that's very widespread and normal in Czech Republic for scientists to do. It's rather a new trend. 
So anytime you are starting something new, you have to deal with a little bit of initial rejection, but that usually goes away after people try it and then have the positive experience, as for example, Peter uh, was talking about. So it's only the overcoming the new, but in overall, later people were, scientists were happy that they participated and they did not regret this experience because it's very in-depth engagement that is very important. I can add to that as well. As we're not a research institution or an organization, we had to turn to one of our members, the Karolinska Institute at KI in Stockholm, and to ask them their uh, researchers on genome editing, and they were very willing to participate. We even had too many experts, so we had to choose. Uh, yeah, and they, they loved the experience. They, they were a little bit hesitant from start, a little bit, but uh, it turned out very well. I'm I can add on to this. To, yeah. yeah, so we don't we don't really have the initial problem of finding people because our institute does a lot of public engagement and outreach, but it was problematic because it was such a long time period. So that was hard to find someone who was willing to do it for the whole entire time. So we had to divide it up and uh, have some people on some days and some on other days. That was more of the issue with us. That was, that was more or less my the views that I was going to share. So there were different roles that the scientists could take within the public dialogue. So they could also participate as being members of the review groups. We review the materials that are going to be used. And then there were also members such as Peter who participated as experts in the dialogues themselves. So depending on the time that they wanted to invest, they could go to one role or to another role. So it depends a little bit on how much time available they have. Thank you. Uh, it's a very nice question now from Naomi Heffer, and maybe I give this to, to Peter. As a junior researcher, what's the best way to get involved in public dialogues? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, I, I, I mean, hopefully you have a public engagement team uh, wherever you work, Naomi. Um, they're usually a, you know, a, the go-to uh, professionals to uh, to get in touch with, I think they'll be delighted to have somebody enthusiastic to be involved, and I'm sure they'll they'll welcome you. Um, if not, uh, at your institute, maybe more broadly um, within the the city or the university where where you work. Um, and you know, it's a bit daunting at first, actually, if you haven't done much. Um, it uses skills um, that you're not necessarily particularly trained to do uh, as a scientist, and so you know we. You know, we communicate with fellow scientists in extremely technical language and um, for a very specific point. So um, I think don't be afraid to, um, you know, seek training, see what, see what resources are available to sort of help you develop the confidence and, and the skills you need. But um, it's a lot of fun. So um, I encourage you to, to get involved. Are there other comments from the other panelists? So we move to the no okay we will, we have very good questions so we have another one from Dan Taylor how do you make sure you get the balance right of providing people with all the information they need to make informed decisions without leading them or biasing responses based on that information we work in AI and so often the information given to set conversation influences people responses this is a great question. So who wants to, who dares to answer first? I, I can. Oh, sorry, oh Peter. Peter. No, Peter, you go. You go first. Well, I, I mean, that's an excellent, I think, and really important question, actually. And um, I just wanted to sort of give my response from my point of view and then others jump in. But I think what's really important to highlight with this, the public dialogue events was um, as scientists, we were there simply to sort of inform the conversation. And what was really important was they had a facilitator on each table. So somebody from Ipsos Mori who was, who was there to, to really facilitate the discussion between, between the public. And so as, a, as the researcher, um, I tended to stay quiet uh, and, and then only chip in when they asked me for, you know, can you explain what this means or can you, you know, what, what would happen then if this happened sort of thing. So more, more factual involvement. Um, and so it, it was a little bit different to, um, you know, some other engagement work that, that we might do, but I saw my role here as, as more informing the conversation rather than trying to um, give my opinions um, on anything. So. 
If I might add into what Peter just said, um, and the question is very, very relevant. Uh, so one of the key parts of uh, the design of the public dialogue of Orion, this one, has been the stakeholder workshops. So I introduced the overall summary of the project in the beginning. Uh, this is the stakeholder workshop. The main aim was exactly the question, the answer to this question. So we wanted to make sure that we provided factual information that was not biased, that we were covering very different points of views, that we were not influencing views. Of course, it's not possible to, to, to to, to achieve it 100% right, right? But by including many different point of views in designing the materials that you're gonna use, you're trying to correct for that biases that you are asking. Maybe I will ask also Jean's view, right? If you also take this to account during the, the evaluation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, a, this is an absolutely critical um, uh, perspective, uh, aspect of, of any engagement. Uh, and the, um, the, the process we saw was, was a very good one uh, that was held by Babraham. They 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 took a, they put a lot of effort into this. They had stakeholder workshops. They had a review panel and advisory panel. Uh, the critical thing is, you can't put too much effort in the proper and uh, neutral, unbiased framing of the problem. You cannot put too much effort in to this aspect, and and it can lead to kind of. Um, sometimes uncomfortable conversations, not particularly in this project, but, but I've been involved in other evaluations to do with, for example, issues like genetically modified foods and crops, which can get very, very um, difficult because it's critical to make sure that you actually have a wide variety of contributors, a wide variety of perspectives, uh, looking at the material you're developing and presenting, including people who are, for example, not necessarily for your technology, but they have alternative viewpoints and perspectives. Now, the key thing is you can't get around this. You have got to bite the bullet and you have got to talk with people who might not share your view on things. Because if you don't, and you ignore these alternative perspectives and you push ahead and you run an event like this uh, with your very particular, very biased framing, um, you will be found out. You will be found out and you will be slaughtered for it. <laughs> okay. so. There's no way around it. You've got to put a lot of effort in. It's hard work. It's difficult. There's no one particular way to do it. But having a wide variety of stakeholders and experts inputting into the materials you're developing is critical. Excellent. Thank you. OK, we have more methodological questions. So um, maybe I combine the two. So what techniques were used to establish common ground and build the trust within the groups? And also, did you train the scientists in any way before they took part in the dialogue? Who wants to start? I Maria, can maybe. Maybe, Emma, maybe you. Um, With the techniques, what, what techniques were used to establish common yes. ground and build trust within the groups? So that was one of the conclusions of the stakeholder workshop. They, they said, okay, we need to, to establish a, a play level field. And the way to, this, to do that, we decided to do an introductory uh, presentation to present key biology uh, terms. And together with that, it was a quiz. And that was a very, very basic one. So we're talking about fundamental biology that is a complex thing, uh, but we went to the very basics, such as gene and, and biology and, and DNA and things like that. Um, so that's what, one of the things that we got feedback from the stakeholders. Um, and then maybe to everybody, so did especially the, the four sites, did you train the scientists in any way before they took part in the dialogue? So Maria, I don't know, did you train the scientists at Karolinska? No, we didn't really do training uh, with them. We had a preparatory meeting and explaining the method and we did go through the whole process. I mean, the whole planning schedule, which was quite uh, long. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so just to explain the process and what their role was, but they also had briefing coming from uh, Ipsos Mori who set it up on what to expect and how to, how to conduct themselves. So they didn't need any training at all. Also, we didn't have any training at the MDC. It was just more one-on-one -on -one kind of talks of what is, what is gonna be happening. I'm still kind of stuck on this question before about the informed decisions. And I have to say that I really noticed that so we gave them a lot of facts that they could work with, but it seemed like that was already kind of 
a big trust in the research that we're doing. So we didn't really have the problem that we had to build a common trust. They put hopes and, and um, yeah. So that was kind of, it. that was an interesting thing because it was like how they, yeah, they, they had informed decisions, but at the same time, there was an aspect of also not quite understanding the science, but still believing in the scientific institution. So it's a little bit productive, but I think I need to add that as part of our experience. Thank you, it's all right, it's important. I just think that, that um, so Maria mentioned briefly, Ipsos Mori produced guidelines for participation for experts. So people like Peter Ragan present here in this panel, um, they just receive a very small briefing on what to do and what not to do. So one of the key things was to not influence the conversation. You are just there to be factual. So to say what you know about genome editing, but do not influence the discussion. That was the basic training we gave. Thank you. Are there more uh, questions? People who wants to to raise their hands or still in the chat? Well, I think I we answer all the questions in the chat. I hope I didn't miss any. And um, I just want to reiterate that for specific findings on the dialogue and differences or similarities across countries in the findings, I would like to invite anyone interested in joining our public launch event on the 21st of January. We do a bit of marketing for next event. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we can go to two conclusions as I, I don't see any, any more questions. Uh, no, there are some, thank you. I, we hope that it's useful. So let me share again uh, my slides. I hope you can see them. So we will just write, like to, to run again uh, menti.com. This is the, the code. And we would like to, to know a little bit what is your take home message from this session. We know it's a short, but um, we would like to, to see a little bit what, uh, what, what you have learned. Um, and I'll, well, I stop uh, sharing again. And I, I leave it to, to Mike. So to, to share a little bit all your all your thoughts. The importance of need, need of clarity and purpose. That was has been importance of the unbiased information. While the process might be arduous, the outcome can be very positive. The purpose again is very important. Think of your reason to do the dialogue. So related to this, also the forward thinking is is important. In the previous one also there was give feedback to participant. This, this is a very important aspect that maybe we didn't discuss so much today. To get a representative perspective is a time consuming and expensive process. Yes, this is also true. Researchers value knowing what the general public supports fundamental research. Yes, Peter can definitely agree on this. <laughs> have you have you a clear idea? So again, the purpose. It's critical to have more events so the public feels they have some agency in science and policy. Such a great project. Thank you. That's, that's nice. <laughs> great to see how you have all worked singly across four different countries. This has been also a challenge, but uh, that was also part of our experiment to see if there were differences among countries. A lot of work shows the importance of dialogue with scientists. The public believe in basic science more than you might expect, yes. And it's our responsibility to make sure they have the knowledge required to understand the research we're doing. Having a plan on what could be done with different outputs, public uh, things X and Y. And we might have a few more, I think with everybody answer. Okay. So, oh, uh, we can, Peter, maybe we go back to the presentation. Uh, Peter, sorry, Mike. Yeah. I share again. Yes. Okay. So 
we come, if I manage to, okay. We, find, we come to the final verdict. So is uh, our public dialogues a valuable tool for higher education institutions, research institutions? And this maybe I would like to give the, the words to, to the four speakers representing the, the four institutes no, where the public dialogues were, were run. So I would like to ask you to say yes, thumb up or no, thumb down. And maybe just a, a very uh, synthetic explanation of why you're yes and, and no. So maybe we start first with Maria at, at VA. We also have some thumbs up from the participants. That's great. Okay. Thank you, Mika. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. It's definitely a, a thumbs up from us because it's given us a, a new method of gathering uh, views and uh, not, and uh, ideas from a wider audience. But also, it's also shown and proven that uh, if you give uh, the general public more knowledge about uh, science and in this case, a uh, new disrupt disruptive technology, it might help also to, to shift attitudes. And also the exchange and a dialogue between the uh, both the uh, the participants and the expert and the, uh, the attitude shift is that has been uh, become have arisen between them. That was a, a valuable experience for us. So uh, definitely yes. Thank you, Maria Zoe. Yeah, also from our side, a definite thumbs up. Um, I think that the opportunity not only for the public to come to us, and uh, you have to remember that most of the people that were in our um, public dialogues, they haven't had genome editing in their school because it hasn't been on the curriculum so long. So they had a really good in-depth opportunity to learn a lot about genome editing, and we had the opportunity to learn about them and our scientists as well. So from our side, very good public engagement um, possibility. Two thumbs up, Esther. Okay, so from Czech Republic and SATEC, it's also a yes, because for us, we had the very positive experience where it engaged a lot of stakeholders and it also inspired change at our institution. And last but not least, Peter. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's a thumbs up from, from me. Um, I mean, I really enjoyed hearing the cross section of views and Reflecting now, I think it, it probably made me understand better the concerns that some people might have about science and where those concerns might come from. And of course, very often shaped by their own personal experiences. And, and I think Jean made an excellent comment earlier when he asked what, what researchers can take forward and, and change in their behavior. What, what have they learned from this? And I think for me, one of the main messages and the discussions we had was um, uh, the public really want to understand the motivations of the researchers um, for carrying out the research. Uh, and then by understanding this, it really helps to build the trust between the public and the scientists. And I think this is something I've overlooked previously and it's something I, I, I can sort of um, use to sort of uh, build on. And one of the other researchers also said that they learned more about the value of asking questions rather than, than just providing information. And, and of course this, it's something they said they will take forward in, in other engagement activities. Um, and of course, just, just lastly, the, you know, we, we hear, we understand the dialogue events are very resource intensive, but from my point of view, it was great to have a, a breadth and engagement activities and a, a common theme that was valued by all of the participating researchers at Babraham was the opportunity to have a longer and more in-depth conversations with members of the public. Thank you. Thank you, and it's uh, it, it's also a thumb up for, for me, especially for the, the sharing you know, of all the participants and especially the, the audience, you know, the great questions that you ask. Here are, are con the contact information for uh, the Orion Open Science Projects. Uh, following a philosophy of open science, we will uh, share our resources, also the, the methodology of the public dialogue you heard about the, the event. And uh, may, maybe we will interact with some of you in the future. And uh, thanks again for all your participation.